Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, a masterpiece of Victorian literature and children's fiction, written by Lewis Carroll, a mathematician, photographer, inventor and Anglican deacon, noted for his facility with wordplay, logic and fantasy. Who was the original Alice? Alice Liddell was the daughter of the Dean of Christ Church College in Oxford. Charles Lutwidge Dodgson, an Oxford mathematician, was a good friend of the Liddell family. In Lewis Carroll was the pen name Charles Dodgson, the Oxford mathematician used as a writer. Where was the story written? Although Wonderland is the ultimate imaginary world, set in a dream where everything is possible, it was written in a real world and was probably inspired by it. Charles Dodgson lived and studied in Christchurch, Oxford. How much do you already know about the story? You certainly know Alice and the White Rabbit, the Caterpillar and the Cheshire Cat, the Mad Hatter and the Queen of Hearts, the Dodo, the Griffin and the Mouse, the tragic and inevitable loss of childhood innocence is one of the themes in the novel. Throughout the course of Alice's adventures in Wonderland, Alice goes through a variety of absurd physical changes. The discomfort she feels at never being the right size acts as a symbol for the changes that occur during puberty. Alice finds these changes to be traumatic and feels discomfort, frustration and sadness when she goes through them. She struggles to maintain a comfortable physical size. In Chapter 1, she becomes upset when she keeps finding herself too big or too small to enter the garden. In chapter 5, she loses control of her specific body parts when her neck grows to an absurd length. These constant fluctuations represent the way a child may feel as her body grows and changes during puberty. Another theme is life as a meaningless puzzle. In Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Alice encounters a series of puzzles that seem to have no clear solutions, which imitates the ways that life frustrates expectations. Alice expects that the situations she encounters will make a certain kind of sense, but they repeatedly frustrate her ability to figure out Wonderland. Alice tries to understand the caucus race, solve the Mad Hatter's riddle, and understand the Queen's ridiculous croquet game, but to no avail. In every instance, the riddles and challenges presented to Alice have no purpose or answer. Even though Lewis Carroll was a logician, in Alice's adventures in Wonderland, he makes a farce out of jokes, riddles and games of logic. Alice learns that she cannot expect to find logic or meaning in the situations that she encounters, even when they appear to be problems, riddles or games that would normally have solutions that Alice would be able to figure out. Carol makes a broader point about the ways that life frustrates expectations and resists interpretation, even when problems seem familiar or solvable. A third theme is death, death as a constant and underlying menace. Alice continually finds herself in situations in which she risks death, and while these threats never materialize, they suggest that death lurks just behind the ridiculous events of Alice's adventures in Wonderland as a present and possible outcome. Death appears in Chapter 1 when the narrator mentions that Alice would say nothing of falling off of her own house since it would likely kill her. Alice takes risks that could possibly kill her, but she never considers death as a possible outcome. Over time, she starts to realize that her experiences in Wonderland are far more threatening than they appear to be. As the Queen screams, off with its head, she understands that Wonderland may not merely be a ridiculous realm where expectations are repeatedly frustrated. Death may be a real threat, and Alice starts to understand that the risks she faces may not be ridiculous and absurd after all. The Moths in the novel Lewis Carroll was a conservative and passionate mathematician who by most accounts was distressed by all the new theories in mathematics that were being sloshed about. It is believed by many that Alice in Wonderland was, in fact, a mathematical satire, 
and Carroll's way of belittling and perhaps even maintaining equilibrium in the face of dramatic change. Magic mushrooms, babies turning into pigs, and absurd questions, why is a raven like a writing desk, were perhaps all meant to show how pointless and annoying these new theories were. In the pool of tears, I'm sure I'm not Ada, she said for her hair goes in such long ringlets and mine doesn't go in ringlets at all. And I'm sure I can't be Mabel, for I know all sorts of things, and she, oh, she knows such a very little. Besides, she, she, and I'm I, and, oh dear, how puzzling it all is. I'll try if I know all the things I used to know. Let me see. Four times five is twelve, and four times six is thirteen, and four times seven is... Oh dear, I shall never get a twenty at that rate. However, the multiplication table don't signify. In the pool of tears, Alice's attempts at simple multiplication leave her confounded. In regular math, four times six would never be thirteen. We work in base ten, meaning we have zero through nine digits, and then, when we get to 10, we move over and put a 1 in the next column. However, if you play around with the base systems, things can change. While Alice was calculating in base 10, in this new crazy wonderland, her answers slipped into higher base systems. People are at risk of getting lost like Alice when they stay anchored to original standards or beliefs in the face of changing systems. Pig and Pepper. The baby grunted again, and Alice looked very anxiously into its face to see what was the matter with it. There could be no doubt that it had a very turn-up nose, much more like a snout than a real nose. Also, its eyes were getting extremely small for a baby. Altogether, Alice did not like the look of the thing at all. But perhaps it was only sobbing, she thought, and looked into its eyes again to see if there were any tears. No, there were no tears. If you're going to turn into a pig, my dear, said Alice seriously, I'll have nothing more to do with you. Mine now. The poor little thing sobbed again, or grunted, it was impossible to say which, and they went on for some while in silence. Alice was just beginning to think to herself, now, what am I to do with this creature when I get it home? When it grunted again, so violently, that she looked down into its face in some alarm. This time, there could be no mistake about it. It was neither more nor less than a pig. It seems simple enough, and yet, Carol craftily disparaged the work of mathematician Jean-Victor Poncelet in this section. Poncelet talked about the transformation of geometric figures and perpetuated the belief that geometric figures undergoing a continuous transformation without any sudden changes or subtractions are likely to retain some of their original features. However, this might not necessarily be physically tangible and would be possible only through the use of things like imaginary numbers. The baby transforming into a pig is Carol's way of showing how absurd and grotesque he found this idea. You can either be a baby or a pig, but no amount of tiny changes can make you both. At a tea party, the least depiction of the mad tea party is filled with unsettling shadows and odd juxtapositions that create sinister and frightening imagery. The tea party floats ambiguously seemingly around a tree and is interspersed with butterflies and oversized insects. In Carol's tea party, the Dormouse, the Mad Hatter and the March Hare are all going in a circle around the table in a perpetual tea time as Carol took away the fourth member of their party, time. In the mid-1800s, mathematician William Rowan Hamilton had come up with a new number system called Quaternions. This was a sort of coordinate system based on four terms, three that designate place or spatial dimensions, and one that designated, or so Hamilton decided, time. With these four terms, Hamilton could describe rotation in a three-dimensional universe. He could only do this, though, if he added that fourth component, 
Without time, they would keep rotating round and round in a plane like the hands of a clock. Carol was miffed that someone could simply appropriate time as a fourth dimension. By taking away time, he left the other three to keep going around in circles forever, like an incomplete Baturnian. Alice sighed wearily. I think you might do something better with the time, she said, than wasted in asking riddles that have no answers. If you knew time as well as I do, said the Hatter, you wouldn't talk about wasting it. It's him. Logic was another weapon of choice for Carol, and the text of Alice in Wonderland is widely sprayed with riddles and logic statement. Take some more tea, the March Hare said to Alice very earnestly. I've had nothing yet, Alice replied in an offended tone, so I can't take more. You mean you can't take less, said the Hatter. It's very easy to take more than nothing. The Mad Hatter is trying to tell Alice that she can have more tea, given that she has not yet had anything to drink, but what she cannot do is take less. The thinking man's work will usually have layers of analytics and aesthetics intertwined with each other. Discovering and then appreciating these layers can be very rewarding. Many of us believe that analytics, mathematics and creativity, whether in writing or painting, are more often than not mutually exclusive. However, if treated with care, the amalgamation of the two can lead to something as unique and enduring as Carol's masterpiece, Alice in Wonderland. You can now continue with a Boolean AND, OR, and NOT operators. In the first book of Wonderland, Alice works away from an inclusive AND, the white rabbit, past the inclusive OR of the caterpillar, the exclusive OR of the Cheshire cat, to the NOT of the Queen of Hearts, who chops off heads. The symbol for not looks a bit like an X next to a capital letter, a symbol for a group much like a wriggle hat who stands for many people. Alice says it is all a bag of cards, meaningless manipulation of symbols and pieces regardless of truth and disrupts her imaginary dream. The white rabbit is like an addition problem and end. Alice and her older sister inclusive of different elements, the two sisters an exclusive, specialized and laid to a specific event at a precise time. Alice was bored that her sister was reading to herself and now Alice charges after the white rabbit down the rabbit hole with no thought as to how she would get out again, like a wildly inclusive child, mirroring the absurdly inclusive combination of a rabbit with a waistcoat and, unlike her sister, who is carefully considering a specialized text. Alice dreams she follows the absurdly complex white rabbit as she can't follow her sister in reading a boring specialized text that gathers a very narrow sort of element. A child needs emotions, pictures, words, and many things to stay interested in a story. Also, unlike Alice, the rabbit is wide awake. Alice finds the hare and hatter having tea together under a tree in front of the hatter's house, with the childlike hare, similar to the white rabbit, and the mad hatter, who is insane in spite of his formal head covering. Mad tea parties were held in insane asylums so that inmates could learn to behave in the world, and just as with little girls, the tea party is an empty formality with empty cups and no tea. The Cheshire cat was right, as either way Alice went, she would have ended up at the same insane party. The two resemble Alice and her sister, the white rabbit and queen of hearts, and the white and red queens of the looking glass, with the heart and mind, child and adult, opposed to each other and Alice alike. When they see Alice, they shout, no room, excluding her before she can say a word. Alice says there is plenty of room and sits down in one of the many empty seats with them. Later we'll learn that the two have been changing places round the table with no thought to what happens afterwards. The hare offers a wine, but then says there isn't any, which Alice says is rude. The hare points out that Alice was rude first for sitting down uninvited, so the hare followed suit changing places around with Alice and mirroring her without thinking of what will result. Alice protests there is more than enough space and the Hatter says she needs a haircut, as there is more than enough of that too. The Hatter is very much a logician like Carol, and cutting things down so they are straight and less hairy is what logicians do. 
Alice tells the Hatter he should learn the lesson not to say personal things, as it is rude, and the Hatter asks her an unsolvable riddle. Why is a raven like a writing desk? Alice is rude. The two are rude to Alice in return. Alice says there is a rule they should learn, but doesn't think she needs to follow the same lesson, and the Hatter replies with an unsolvable riddle. Much as Carol says logic seems unsolvable. Raven and writing desk both sound like they start with R, but due to impractical formalities, writing begins with a silent W. Alice likes riddles, though she didn't like the puzzling conversation it resembles, and she says she believes she can guess, which Wittgenstein would call nonsensical, as if we can guess we don't need to go through the motions of believing it as a second reinforcing step. The hare asks her if she means she can think she can find out the answer, adding additional absurd steps. Alice agrees with his reformulation of her intention, and the hare tells her she should say what she means, as if Alice really meant what he said rather than what she did, even though it sounded like he was offering her a clarifying equivalent expression. Alice says she means what she says, or says what she means, and the two are the same thing. The hatted human logician steps in and insists that the two are not equivalent at all, denying Alice's substitution as the hare did hers, and he explains as a logician would why A is B is not the same thing as B is A. If the two are identical, then the two are the same, but if A's are B's, this is opposite B's are A's and not the same at all. If there is one thing Alice says and means, saying and meaning both, she is right, but if Alice says things that can have many meanings or means things that can be said many ways, then the things Alice says and the things she means are not identical sets at all. The Hatter doesn't explain it this way, but gives Alice an example. I see what I eat isn't the same thing as I eat what I see. The hair follows with another example. I like what I get isn't the same as I get what I like. The Dormouse offers another. I breathe when I sleep isn't the same as I sleep when I breathe. But the Hatter again interrupts and says that the two are the same for the Dormouse, as the Dormouse is always both breathing and sleeping. The Hatter pulls out his watch, which is broken even though the hare used the best butter to fix it. The Hatter tells Alice that his watch doesn't tell the minute or hour, as those stay the same for him. But it does tell the day, and it is two days off, which means the tea party lives time inside out, with the particular position staying the same, but the exclusive day changing, much like several people being rude to each other, stuck in the same mood, but in different exclusive positions as arguing individuals. It is also like trying to fix a watch with good butter, as the particular thing is good, but doesn't make the larger situation better, as what is good in one position is good in another, as the party has already taught Alice. Just as Alice says she has never been to a stupider party, she finds a door in a tree that leads back to the hall with a glass table, and she now has the tools to solve the puzzle and get into the Queen of Hearts garden. In the end of both stories, Alice similarly declares everything stupid before rising up and breaking out of her dream. As she grows, she begins pushing back against those who don't make sense to her, like adults sadly do, so she's ready for croquet with a queen.